As soon as you are ready, Andrea, you can. Uh, See. Okay. Is that right? Can you, are you seeing the right screen? That's perfect, yes. Great. Ah, yes. Let me just turn on the, the computer, then you can see the audience. Okay. Okay, let's see. Um, let, me, let me go back a little bit. Um, okay. Okay, so um, I'm just going to pick up where I left off yesterday. So yesterday, you know, I talked about how for particles of a given softness, the probability of rearranging is Arrhenius for a given softness. So there's a well-defined energy and entropy barrier for each softness. And, um, and so today, what I'm going to talk about is how we use that. So we're going to take that as given, okay? We're going to say, Suppose we know that delta E, the entropy and en entropy and energy barriers associated. Hold on, let me get the right thing here. Uh, da, 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 why am I not getting the spotlight? Okay, there. Um, what? Why is it not doing this? Oh, it's doing a spotlight over here. Ah, you're seeing. Are you seeing the right screen? Uh, we are seeing onset temperature. Okay, good. Okay, great. Um, what I need to do is to just swap the screens here. Um, oh, now you're seeing the wrong thing. Are you seeing the wrong thing now? We see two uh, two slides, the oh, same two. Hold on, let me let me let me stop this share and show it to the proper screen. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so. Now, let me go back to the Zoom. All right, and let me get my talk back. There. Now, are you seeing the right thing? The, we see again the onset temperature, only one slide. Is it right? Perfect. Okay. Perfect. Okay, and now you see my, my mouse. Okay. All right. So, um, All right, so now what I want to show is what if we take that energy and entropy barriers given for a given softness, okay? And now what we want to do is try to, to develop a theory that, that captures these things, the decreasing softness with decreasing temperature, right? The non arrhenius relaxation time and spatially heterogeneous dynamics. All right, so how do we get that? Um, so, so these are things we want to understand. So first of all, let me um, describe how we quantify the dynamic heterogeneous, yeah, dynamic heterogeneity, sorry. So that's done through a quantity called the overlap parameter, okay? So the overlap parameter measures how far um, each particle moves from its given, from its initial position at time t equals zero. So you start with t equals zero, you say, how long does it take for each particle to move away? And you can look at the mean of this quantity. So this is the average overlap. And what you see is that, right, at a higher temperature, that's the red, um, it decays more rapidly. And as I lower the temperature, it decays more slowly. Okay, so that's the mean of the overlap per particle. I can also look at the variance of that overlap, okay? And from particle to particle, or from time, initial time to initial time. And that variance, okay, is peaked basically where the overlap is the steepest, right? That's where the difference from particle to particle is, um, is uh, the greatest. Um, and so you have, and that's called chi four of T, okay? So that's the variance. Um, of the overlap, and uh, and that has a peak, okay, which is low at high temperatures, okay, and gets bigger and bigger as you lower the temperature, okay. That peak gets higher and higher, um, and from this thing, we're going to pull out two things, okay. First, the relaxation time is can be defined as the peak where the peak is for this quantity. So for each temperature, I can look at where the peak is, right, and, and pull out the relaxation time. That's a definition of the relaxation time. 
The other thing I want to pull out from this is the magnitude of the peak. How high is the peak? Okay, and that we'll call that chi four stars. So that measures the dynamical heterogeneity. Now, so I'm first going to start with a model where we just, as I said, we take as given the energy and entropy barriers for each particle determined by their softness. Okay, and we say, okay, there's some probability that the particle will rearrange, right? That's that's what I was showing you earlier, the Sarrhenius probability. Okay, so now imagine, so we can just, for example, put this on a lattice. So each site has a softness, okay? It, each site is going to evolve independently given its softness. So given its softness, there's some pro probability that it will, re this site will, will have a rearrangement. If it rearranges, then it has a new softness that's drawn from some distribution. Okay, which we take to be independent of T, and we take it to be the distribution of softness that you have at the onset temperature. Okay, and now you assume that everything else is unaffected, and you just let this thing go. So the softness distribution will evolve according to this with temperature. Okay, and this is what comes out. So this is the black is sort of our ground truth. That's the molecular dynamic simulations. Okay, uh, the Cope Anderson model. And the blue dashed line is the predictions of this theory. And I call it a trap like model because it's it's basically very analogous. It's it's using the ideas of um, the trap model by Jean-Philippe Bouchot. And I should have had that that reference here, but it was in the 1980s. It was a long time ago. Um, I think that he introduced the trap model, maybe 1990s. Okay, um, so if you take take this model, what you see is that you get the softness distribution quite wrong, okay? Uh, because um, because the average softness is is pretty far from from the black, and you just look at the scale, right? The black, for example, at the lowest temperature here is at point minus 0.5 average softness, but we're getting minus 1.75, which is many many times, you know which is in terms of the standard deviation, this this is far. Okay, that's outside the standard deviation. Um, surprisingly though, it gets the trend in the relaxation time not so bad. Okay. And it is, as you see, it is super arrhenius. It is curved upwards, um, like the like the MD data. Um, if I compare it to the prediction of the overlap parameter, um, at, this is at different temperatures. So the, the solid is the MD and the dashed is the trap model. You see that I do worse and worse as I go. And it's actually even worse than this because here, well, okay, I'm not gonna go into it, but okay, it does badly. It does even bad, more, worse than this, this plot would say. But the real problem is this, if I look at the peak of the variance of the overlap, peak of chi four star, I'm going to just adjust it to be the same at the onset temperature. You see that, you know, and it, it should grow, the peak height should grow, as I said, but the trap model, it's dead flat, okay? Um, and you think, why should there be no dynamical heterogeneity? Um, I have different particles have different softnesses. And so isn't that enough that, you know, some particles will be more mobile and other particles will be less mobile. But this is an effect of the, the dynamical heterogeneity that you see at a later time, at a, a relaxation time later, is not simply that. It's coming about from correlations that basically you get this kind of, what, the fact that this is dead flat is consistent with this idea that people have that you what you need is what is called facilitation. That you need, if there's a rearrangement here, it'll trigger another rearrangement, which can trigger another rearrangement, and you get um you get this sort of correlated dynamics, and that correlated dynamics is the dynamical heterogeneity. Okay, and that's missing because all the particles are evolving independently in this model. 
So that points to what we need. We need to include correlations. So here's the idea of our theory, okay? The idea is the following. If you have some structure, which we quantify by softness, okay? We know how that tells us which particles will rearrange, right? Because from softness, we can get the probability of rearranging. We get the energy and entropy barriers. That tells us, you know, which particles are going to rearrange. But then if there's a rearrangement, that's going to change the softness, right? Because the softness is a measure of the local structure. So if I have a rearrangement, that's going to scramble the local structure. It can, and it's, it not only affects the particle that's rearranging, but it can affect other particles that are nearby, okay? Now you can call that facilitation, but remember this thing is in thermal equilibrium, okay? So what can, what can happen this way can go backwards. In other words, if this particle makes, if this particle here rearranges and makes this particle softer, right? That means that, that, that if this particle, if I do it backwards, okay, that must also work. So it cannot just make particles softer. It also has to make them harder. And in fact, the point is that any changes that you have in the softness that are due to rearrangements have to be consistent with detailed balance. Okay. And that's something that actually people had not worked out in these sorts of models before. And it, it, and it was tricky. So I'm just going to try to get give you a feel for this without dragging you through the details, okay? So the idea is the following, that first of all, the magnitude of the change of softness, okay? So suppose it's the red particle that's rearranging. The magnitude of the change of softness some distance away must decay with distance, right? Um, and so that's one thing. So I have R, which is, oh, sorry, I should have called it R prime. Uh, this, is, this is bad notation. So I'm going to put my rearranging particle at R and my uh, spectator particle at R prime, OK? My, and I'm going to call my rearranging particle, or I could call my rearranging particle I and my um, spectator particle J. OK, so there's some kernel basically that tells you how the magnitude of the change of softness uh, Andrea. depends. Yeah, Andrea, uh, Fred. Um, so uh, sorry, one thing you just said a moment ago triggered me. Uh, so um, you 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 said satisfying detail balance. Should we worry about that when we're getting to some long uh, some very slow processes and and long relaxation times and so on? Ah. Uh. Is, so, is that, is, will that yeah, come up because later? we're not in equilibrium. Well, we're not yeah, in equilibrium, or, or at least so some, degrees of, some degrees of freedom are falling out of equilibrium, so maybe on the timescales of interest, detail balance isn't relevant. I don't know. Right. Is that something? So the general picture is that basically the non-equilibrium part is just basically excluding paths that take you to the crystal. But otherwise, the system is in thermal equilibrium. OK. And it's certainly a local thermal equilibrium, if you it, you know, in, and you can see that in the simulations. So 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 locally, it's all in thermal equilibrium, whether on very long length and time scales, it's or, or it's it's not you know, uh, because you're excluding the crystal states. It's true you are excluding crystal states, but um, that's all you need. And in fact, people do that in simulations. They just exclude configurations where you start having little crystallites and you stay in the super cold liquid and, you know, um, but otherwise, otherwise you're in thermal equilibrium. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, so that's what we're assuming here. Um, oh, and actually a lot of what we're studying, you know, is in the liquid above the glass transition. So we're, we are still able to reach equilibrium. Okay. So, so this says, so we allow for a kernel this, that, that correlates the changes of uh, the softness of a particle at R prime with the, with the softness of a particle at R, and that decays with the distance between R minus R prime. We also have a kernel 
which says that the change of the softness of my spectator particle be, could be correlated with um, the softness of my initial particle. Okay, um, that's this. And we take into account the fact that softness itself has spatial correlations. I, I showed you that, right? They, these are correlations that decay exponentially on the scale of a particle size. Okay, so that's basically, these are the three sorts of kernels. You say, oh my God, this is terrible, right? What a mess. But the point is that it turns out that time reversal symmetry imposes constraints so they're not independent. So that once you say this, well, how does the magnitude of uh, the change of softness depend on, on the change of softness over here? And you say, that what are the correlations of softness? That actually dictates how the change of softness here can depend on the softness over here. Okay. Um, and so, and so here's the idea. Okay. So I, I, not, I will explain that a little bit more in a bit. Okay. So let's suppose now we have a, a each side I has some softness. I'm going to put this on a lattice. Okay, for simplicity. Each side I has some softness. So there's some vector of softnesses, one for each site. Okay. And each site, as I said, rearranges with that probability given by the Arrhenius dependence, given that energy barrier and entropy barrier. Okay. And now we allow the rearrangements to change the softnesses, both of the site that's rearranging and neighboring sites. Okay. That's a change of that vector S. And the constraint of detailed balance imposes this for the transition probabilities. Okay. And the idea is that if the distribution of softnesses itself is near is Gaussian, and and it is, in fact, nearly Gaussian. It's a little bit skewed, but you know, we're gonna just treat it as Gaussian for the purposes of the theory. Okay, with some mean and some variance. This is a matrix, okay, sigma. And it turns out that the distribution of the change of softnesses, okay, we can measure that as well, okay, it's also nearly Gaussian, okay? And it has some mean, okay, and some variance. And this, these are, again, these are matrices. Okay, what does H mean? Okay, H is how does the soft the change of softness here depend on the initial softness of, of either of the same particle or of a different particle? So H equals one. Okay, if I set H equals one, then delta S is S new minus S old, the S's cancel. And what you see is H equals one means that there is no memory at all of the initial softness. The initial softness doesn't affect anything. Whereas H equals zero means perfect memory of the initial softness. But as I said, H can't be just anything, okay? Um, basically the, the, the spread of, you, you can't, the distributions when you when you had detailed balance, right? The distributions have to have to have. How, how can I say this? What's the best way to explain this? Um, the the distributions have to have variances that are consistent. It's like when you have detailed balance, the magnitude of your noise is dictated by um, by uh, by your correlations, and and that's exactly what we're doing here. It's that's 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 effectively what we're saying here. Okay. And so that gives us constraints on this matrix, as I said, and also this, um, which has to do with the mean of that distribution. So we can measure elements of the matrices. Okay. So um, uh, they, they go into these, these correlation matrices. And each matrix element, it's nice. It decays exponentially. And it decays exponentially with the same correlation length. 
So it really can be described um, in this way. So, so this is a picture that is really sort of consistent with itself, okay? It's a really nice exponential decay with a consistent correlation length. Um, and when we now just put that into this lattice model and see how does it evolve, then what comes out is the distribution of softness. We're not putting it in by hand. At each temperature, the distribution of softnesses will adjust itself according to you know, these correlations. Um, and what we get now is really quite a decent agreement between the average softness um, in the theory and in the experiment. You see now the scale, okay? The, the deviations are small compared to the standard deviations. The differences are small compared to standard deviation of the distribution. The overlap now looks quite good, okay? So we're, ca we're capturing that, that decay, that non exponential decay of the overlap. Um, you remember from the chi four, we can pull out the peak height and the time scale. So here's the time scale. Again, it's 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 quite good, okay. And uh, chi four itself is increasing as I lower the temperature. The peak height is increasing as I lower the temperature. Again, not bad, okay. And um, and I can measure a correlation length. In other words, um, what is what is the overlap function? How is the overlap function over here at R correlated with the overlap function in R prime? Okay, so those are the correlations of the dynamical heterogeneity. And again, that that the temperature dependence of that looks very good. It's a little off, and that has to do with how we choose the lattice size relative to the particle size. And we haven't tried to adjust that. We just set the lattice size equal to the particle size. Okay, so. Um, so we're getting really very reasonable quantitative agreement and there are no adjustable parameters here, right? All we put in are those correlation, correlation matrices um, and then the energy and entropy barriers for rearrangement. So the fact that this is working and the trap model did not tells us what are the ingredients that are really important to capture dynamical heterogeneity one is facilitation, this, uh, this idea that, you know, there's some change of softness nearby due to a rearrangement here. And the other key thing, and you have to, you cannot do one without the other if you want to bait to balance, is that you need the spatial correlations of softness. Okay, I hope, I'm, I don't want to get into the guts of this theory because it's it's a bit detailed, but I hope at least that gives you some feel for what goes into it. Um, so, and uh, I want to, the credit for this really goes to my graduate student, Sean Rideout, who, who just finished. Well, he finished Adrian? last November. Yeah. Hi, Itai. Um, so you wrote a theory for the softness, yes. essentially, using the correlations of softness, correct? or correlations of particle-particle pl placement? That, that is the question. I'm trouble hearing, I'm having trouble hearing you. Is this Ben? The, hi, can you hear me now? Yeah, that's much better. Okay, yeah. hi, it's Itai. Um, so the question is, oh, um, did you use softness-softness correlations to predict the evolution of softness? That's right. So softness, soft, what goes into this are softness, softness correlations, and which is in, in, encoded in this matrix. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the other thing is change of softness, change of softness correlations. And the prediction is? <laughs> which is encoded in this matrix. And you predict an entire distribution based and on And then this. what comes out are change of softness, softness correlations, which are in H, mm -hmm. okay? Um, that, that has to be constrained by detailed balance. Uh -huh. but, the, but the key is softness correlations and correlations, change of softness, change of softness correlations. And then what is the prediction of the theory again? I'm sorry. Excuse me? What is the prediction of the theory then? What is the prediction of the theory? The prediction are, is, is all of these things. These are the predictions. 
So all of these things, uh, the, the, the softness distribution itself, mm -hmm. the overlap parameter, okay, how that things. decays, the mean and the variance of it, um, the, the time scale, the relaxation time, and the, the magnitude and range of dynamical heterogeneities as a function of temperature. These are all predictions then that come from the model. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, yeah. yeah and all we put in are those correlations. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'm gonna move now from glassy dynamics to, to plasticity, okay? So, and what comes now, what I wanna talk about is how the system responds to um, shearing or some kind of mechanical load, okay? So if we first look at what happens below yield, okay? So remember, and this is work that was done, these are the, the four people who really pushed it and, and, and my former colleague, Dan Gianola. Um, and it actually involved every single person and our MERSEC IRG uh, in this group, collaborative group uh, that was funded by the NSF. Um, so uh, it involved all of these, all of these people and, and their students and postdocs. Okay. So, um, and this goes back to this thing that I said that, right, that solids actually can flow. Um, and that, you know, you can see elastic behavior and then you see liquid behavior at high strains and in between there's yield. So now what we're looking at is what happens right around here, okay? If you look at the behavior right around here, okay? Um, it turns out that that's sort of universal. So um, let's take a closer look, okay? Um, so if you, if you look at the average over many configurations, you get something that looks like this, okay? If you look over um, at individual starting configurations, individual trajectories, you get something that's very jagged, right? And, um, and this is, if you do it at zero temperature, infinitely slowly, you get these very sharp drops of the stress. I don't know if Jim Sutton talked about this, you get crackling noise and these avalanches, okay? I'll, I'll talk about that more in a bit, okay? Um, but what we're talking about is sort of right around here, okay? Just around the place where it's, it's no longer elastic, you're starting to get some yielding, um, but you haven't fully yielded, you haven't reached the state where it's, it's going. So what we did was we looked at a bunch of systems, both simulations and experiments, okay? where we could look at the constituent particles and follow them as a function of time, okay? And we trained on all of these systems, we trained for softness. And, uh, and these systems are really different, okay? So some of them like Leonard Jones, right? The oligomer molecules, you know, um, you know, <laughs> The, the colloids and stuff have Van der Waals attractions. Um, in the in the case of the polymers, you know there were covalent interactions, and in the silica there were covalent interactions. In the case of the colloids, there were screened electrostatic repulsions. There were hardcore repulsions in the grains, right? So really, really different kinds of interactions in these systems. And you can see that um, oh, they range across scales, right? From atoms all the way to grains, they, they range in size over, you know, about uh, nine orders of magnitude. Um, and and um, the sources of the rearrangements um, are very different, okay? In some of them, the rearrangements, for example, in the, in the systems studied by the origin yod, they come from thermal fluctuations and um, in the Leonard Jones and silica thing, in other cases, they're driven by mechanical load. Okay, so so for these systems, you know, okay. Oh, okay, seven orders of magnitude in particle size, 13 orders of magnitude in elastic modulus, okay? Um, but we can train on softness for all of these different systems. These are just two pictures, 
one from experiment, one from a simulation. And we, we you know, so we extract D squared min, we train on that to get softness. And the interesting thing is, first of all, the size of rearrangements. You can get an estimate of size of rearrangements in the spatial correlations of D squared min, which is the non affine displacement. Okay, it decays exponentially, and you can pull out a decay length. And if you look at the softness, that also decays exponentially. As I said before, I showed you the decaying, you know, the exponential decay. Okay, again, on the scale of a particle diameter. And so for these six systems, okay, this is plotted as a function of their particle diameter. We can plot the ratio of the size of a rearrangement to the size of the spatial correlations. And those are the spatial correlations of softness that went into that model I was just telling you about for glassy dynamics. And what you see is that this is really tightly distributed around one, okay? So what this is saying is that the reason why you get localized rearrangements in disordered solids is because there is that scale in the structure. That structure is correlated on the scale of a uh, on the scale of a particle, and that's setting the size of rearrangements. They're the same. The size of the rearrangements is the si same as a, as the length scale for softness correlations. Okay. So that was the first thing. Um, and we could even put the vertex model of epithelial tissues on this, and, and that's that's on there too. Okay, so so even for cells. Um, what about crystals? Well, you see right away that for crystals, for example, in this case, the grain size is important. The grain size is really important in plasticity. Microstructure in crystals determines plasticity. And so the size of rearrangements can be very extended. It's not universal for crystals. And the softness correlation length reflects the size of grains and grain boundaries. Again, it's not universal at all. Okay. The other thing is we could plot the yield stress for all of these systems, okay, versus the Young's modulus and measure the stiffness. Okay. And here it is for many different systems, I forgot how many, 12, 12 different systems, okay? As I said, this involved everybody in the collaboration. So, so from experiments on amorphous carbon and on and metallic glasses, okay, to the granular systems um, and foams and colloids, okay? And here, it's amazing. They are really tightly distributed around this, value corresponding to a yield strain of about 3%, okay? Whereas crystalline systems are all over the map, okay? They're not nearly as tightly distributed as for disordered systems. Again, because the microstructure is important. So, so what's sort of cool is that even though softness itself is different for each system, so we have to train separately for each system to get the softness, but the emergent properties of softness, the range of softness correlations, the size of rearrangements, the magnitude of the yield stress, you know, these are, these are actually you know, much more universal. So, so the hope is maybe we'll understand distorted solids better than crystals someday, because uh, the state of understanding plasticity for crystals is, is a bit of a mess. So now let me tell you about how we understand plasticity in disordered solids, okay? So we now have a, a, a theory for how to do this, okay? And this I had to feature um, my former postdoc, Good Jane, who's now um, a tenure track at City University in Hong Kong. It's really terrific. Okay, so what we're gonna do now is we're going to look at behavior beyond yield. So behavior out here, we have just one avalanche after another as, as, as you share, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, start here, okay? And you see the stress drop. The stress drop corresponds to an avalanche. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna start at the top and we're gonna just do gradient descent and look at what happens as we go down, just during that stress drop, what is happening? Okay, 
So if I look from the beginning to the end of the stress drop, here's a picture of d squared min, okay? d squared min, you see that it's it's concentrated in, in some places, it's very high in some places, low in others, and it's very extended. It, it goes across the whole system. But here's now a movie of what's happening as we're doing that stress drop. You, I don't, I hope you can see. There are these little localized rearrangements. They fluctuate around and then they jump elsewhere. Okay, so that's what the dynamics looks like during this process. They are, the avalanches are composed of these very localized rearrangements. Okay, that it can jump from one region to another. So that's what we would like to be able to understand. Okay. What Sorry, Andrea, that? how how do you how define do the, this point that we are looking at? How how is it defined? You know, the point that we are looking at the screen now. Does so avalanche. this is a movie of the simulation, the 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 um, particle simulations. Okay, so these are. Um, uh, these are Hertzian particles that are driven uh, very slowly under shear, zero temperature, and we're and we're looking at during at it during a stress drop. So we're just doing gradient descent from the top of the stress drop to the bottom, and this is a picture of d squared min. Okay, so that's the point where yeah, I see the the, the stress strain curve you take when uh, when the system is crashing is avalanching. To yes, okay. Yes. Perfect. Yeah. Thank this you. is a picture of, of the avalanche during one of the stress drops. Okay. But this yeah. is very characteristic. You know, they all look like yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So we're going to train softness, okay? Um, again, we do the same thing. We train softness during the avalanche now, okay? And what we find is that it works really well. So the probability of rearranging as a function of softness, look at this. I mean, it actually changes by, you know, almost five orders of magnitude, four orders of magnitude over the range of softness. Okay, so it's a really strong function of the softness. So what we want to work out, what we need to understand is there's an interplay of several different things, okay? When I have a rearrangement, just as I said before, when I have a rearrangement, I can change the softness of particles nearby, okay? In fact, it turns out, as I'm going to show you, a rearrangement lowers the softness of particles nearby in a ductile solid, okay? And that affects the, so that affects the softness. The other thing, though, that a rearrangement gives rise to a strain and this strain can propagate. It's an elastic strain, right? It, it's long range. So it can, that can change the softness of particles that are even far away. So there's a string field that's created by the rearrangement that can change the softness. And then the softness, right, tells you how likely you are to have a rearrangement. And if the strain is large enough, it can push you over and you can have a rearrangement, another rearrangement elsewhere. Okay, so that's that interplay that we need to capture. We need to first untangle it, okay, understand piece by piece, and then the idea is to construct a model that en encapsulates that interplay. Okay. So the way we take it apart piece by piece is we look, we say, okay, we look at each piece individually. First, how do rearrangements give rise to a string? Okay, so if I have, now I have a rearrangement at the origin and I look at how that affects the string and it turns out I can look at different components of the string. So first of all, there's a volumetric string. In other words, when I have a rearrangement here, I change the local volume, okay? The local volume actually changes. And so there's a piece that is transient because on the whole, the volume of the system is fixed, okay, um, um, that decays with time, okay? But then there's a second piece, okay, which decays as R squared, we're in two dimensions here, so this is elasticity, and it has a dipolar form. It has this, this angular dependence. What 
models, uh, so there are lots of models to look at the interplay of rearrangements with elasticity. And almost all of them assume that the important thing is the interplay of rearrangements with the, if I'm shearing in the X, Y direction, what's important is the interplay of rearrangements with the strain in the X, Y direction. And that decays as one of our squared, and it's got this quadrupolar shape or it's an elastic dipole. You know? Okay, so this, this is called an elastic dipole, but it's really um, this sort of quadrupolar angular dependence. Um, and then there's a deviatoric strain. In other words, I could treat, I, if, I have, I, if I have this rearrangement, different rearrangements are in different orientations. And so I can trigger a strain elsewhere um, that is angle um, independent coming from different uh, arrangements. Okay. So now let's look at how this affects softness. So I look and look at the change of softness. Okay. What I see is the change of softness decays as one over R squared in the far field, and it has this shape, angular dependence. There's less soft here, softer here. And if I compare that to what I had before, look at these, that's exactly what the volumetric strain looks like. And here it's compressing, okay, it makes it less soft. Here it's dilating, it makes it more soft. It all makes sense, right? So what this says is that the way a rearrangement affects softness far away is through the volumetric strain, okay? You can just read it off from this. Um, I think it sounds so easy, but it, <laughs> it took us a year to figure this out. Um, all right, that this was the way to figure every, to disentangle everything. So that's the far field. What about the near field? Hi, well, hi near Andrea. Field, we right? have a question. Rearrangements scramble local structure, and that changes the softness. And if you look at that, that decays away with distance. Okay. And it's cool. It has this form. It has a very simple form. What it says is that there's something that depends on the softness of the particle. It's exactly the form that I showed you earlier, in fact, in, in our theory, where there's a, some thing that says softness gets restored to some mean. In this case, it's the, the, the softness of its neighbors. It wants to be like the softness of, there's a term that wants it to be like the softness of its neighbors. There's this volumetric term. And then there's a noise term, right? Because this is, there's stochasticity and all. I mean, this, you know, you don't, you don't always get the same thing. Um, there's, there's disorder in here. So that gives a noise term. So that's the this that's this is how we change softness nearby. Andrea, can I ask a question? Yes. Usually, this this uh, if you can come back to slides. Um, one more, yes. So usually, this this angular response, the dipol dipolar response, is an average over several configurations, right? Is it is it the case here? Right. Usually, people just worry about this. Okay. And that's, that's definitely there. But in fact, for this problem, that's not the important. That's partly what's important, but, but how, how it turns out that how the rearrangement affects softness is through this term, which people never worry about. I see, but I mean, this is a, an average in several configurations or, or not? That's right. This is a, okay. an average over many rearrangements. That's right, okay. Okay, right. And yeah. this is this is in the in this in the lattice, what you're looking at. No, this no. is from the particle simulations. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Um, all right. So um, then we say, okay, what's if I what's the pair correlation for a rearrangement? If I have a rearrangement at the origin, what's the probability of finding a rearrangement at some distance far away? Right that decays and it's isotropic. It's nearly isotropic. And what that says is that shear strain in any direction, not just the XY direction can trigger a rearrangement. It's actually, this isotropic thing is like the deviatoric strain, not like this. Okay, so again, that's a difference from typical models. So a rearrangement can give rise to a deviatoric strain and the deviatoric strain, if the particle is soft enough, the deviatoric strain can push it over the edge to have another rearrangement. That's what comes out of the model. And 
as I said, elastic plastic models are much simpler. They just have, there's a rearrangement that gives rise to a strain, an XY strain that can in turn trigger another rearrangement. Okay, so that's that interplay. Now let's put it on a lattice. How do we put it on a lattice? Okay, so for each, so normally what you do in an elastoplastic model, and this is, there's a nice review um, in Revision Modern Physics of elastoplastic models. The idea is you have, for example, a bunch of blocks, okay? Each block, you assign a local strain to it, okay? And there's a local yield strain. And then you apply strain, you just increment epsilon xy for each block. And then when it reaches the yield strain, you reset it to zero, okay? And then you update the other blocks according to, you know, the strain due to that quadrupolar field. And the point is that the yield strain distribution is put in by hand and it doesn't ever change. It's just what you give it. You, usually people just give it a delta function. There was a nice paper by Matthew of the Arts Group that showed that you could tune the system from brittle to ductile behavior by changing that yield strain distribution that you put in. Okay. Um, so, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take then the the results that came out of working out this interplay, and we're gonna put it on the lattice, okay? So, um, so the idea is rearrangements can affect the softness by creating volumetric strain. That's this, this piece here, okay? What does the softness do? The softness determines the yield strain distribution, okay? And the rearrangement um, can also change the softness of particles nearby. Okay, so there's a far field piece coming from the volumetric strain. There's a new, near field piece coming from scrambling that we worked out. That changes the softness. The rearrangement also gives rise to a deviatoric strain. We have also apply a strain, which can affect the deviatoric strain. And if then the strain is bigger than the yield strain, then you get another rearrangement. Okay, so that's the model. Um, and the piece that I did not show you yet is that the softness determines the yield strain. So for each softness, okay, for particles that have given softness, we can measure in the simulation, the particle simulation, the yield strain distribution, the distribution of local yield strains, okay? And what you see is that particles that are have very low softness have distributions that have much lower, they're much higher yield stresses, okay? And as I increase the softness, the yield stress distribution shifts down, okay? Both in its peak, okay, and the tail. And it's actually given by the Weibull distribution and it's an extreme value distribution, which makes sense because this is local yield stress. This is the, we're sh shearing this, is the, this local region in all directions and saying, where is it the lowest? So that's the extreme value, um, and, uh, and 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 it has this extreme value form. Okay, so that's all we that's that's what we do. And so now we put that all in. We let it go. We figured out all this interplay, right? That that tells us everything. Okay, and and this is remember this is what we got in the particle simulations. Okay, on the left. On the right is what we get in the step model simulations. Again, localize your arrangements. They can jump around qualitatively. It looks very similar. And um, quantitatively, it looks pretty good too. So here's stress versus strain. You know, uh, we're off a little bit on the magnitude of the yield stress. This again is something that people have shown in elastic plastic models it really depends on how you've chosen your lattice size. And we haven't chosen it. We've just set it to be equal to the particle size. But here's the avalanche distribution. We do quite well with the avalanche size distribution, the, so the distribution of the size of stretch drops. And the softness distribution emerges from this. We're not putting it in by hand again. And um, the steady state softness distribution is quite good too. Okay, So um, that's for the ductile solids. Um, but now what we'd like to do is ductile versus brittle behavior, right? Um, we know that 
some systems can can bend, right? Whereas others just break, just form shear bands and break. And so can we use these sorts of models to understand what controls ductility? That's what we're going for, okay? So it turns out that our proxy for ductility is going to be strain localization. So in the more dis ductile system, the strain, this is a picture of strain, strain is spread over a large region. So here what we're doing is these are polymer nanopillars that are being pulled, okay? The, these are simulations. And in the more ductile case, the strain is, is distributed over a wide region, whereas in the more brittle case, it's really narrowly localized into this band. That's the shear band, okay? And it eventually breaks there at the shear band, okay? And what my colleague Rob Rugelman at Penn showed a while ago was that, uh, a few years ago, was that um, as you tune the interaction range, okay, you can tune the ductility. And so the shorter the range of interactions, the less ductile, the, the more localized the, 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 the strain is. So based on that, um, Doug Durian and his postdoc, Hong Yi Xiao, made a granular raft, okay, that's floating on oil. And that gives a capillary attraction between the particles. And that the range of attraction is fixed, okay? It's just the capillary length. So it's determined by the surface tension and the density and gravity. So it's about 1.8 millimeters. But what they can vary is the size of the particle. So they can vary the range of the interaction relative to the size of the particle, which is what matters, okay? So they could do this for different size particles. And again, by tuning the particles, they could get either uh, uh, less localized or more localized strain. And this is just a picture. You see this one's quite, quite localized in strain as they pull it apart. Um, and so you see that for the one millimeter particles where there's a longer attractive range relative to the size of the particle, the strain is more distributed whereas in the three millimeter particles where the attractive range is shorter compared to the particle size, the strain is more localized, okay? Just like in the polymer simulations that Rob Rickleman did. And here, here. So another way to do it is by, um, is by how you prepare your system. And so the better in yield the system is, Okay, the better equilibrated system is the less ductile. And, and there were simulations in 2014, again, by Rob Riggleman that showed this for these polymer pillars. So you see that the better annealed system, the strain is more localized up here, okay? Whereas down here, it's, it's more distributed in the less, uh, less annealed system. And this was shown really dramatically and beautifully in um, simulations using Monte Carlo swap by uh, Misaki Ozawa, where um, the better the better annealed systems. I showed you what happened for the ductile systems. Um, uh, look like that, but for the really well annealed systems, you see these really strong shear bands. Okay, forming very localized shear bands forming. So. When we then tried to train on softness for these systems, we found a problem, which is that for this system, okay, we could not train softness on rearrangements. There, there weren't enough rearrangements here for one thing before the formation of the shear band. Until you formed the shear band, there weren't enough rearrangements. And, the, and if we trained in this region, um, we did not capture this behavior at all. We, we could not capture the the the, um, the rearrangements very well, and it turned out that. So, uh oh, I don't have these in the right order. Let me see if I can. Okay, um, yeah, okay, I have it down the order now. All right, um, all right. So, remember, we're going through we're training softness on rearrangements, and then we're saying, oh, for softness, right. For each softness, we get a yield strain distribution. But 
you know, why not cut out the middleman? Why train on rearrangements? Why not train directly on local yield stress, which I showed you yesterday did inc incredibly well as a predictor. It's an incredibly expensive calculation and it requires knowing the interactions between the particles. So it's not a great um, system for that, okay? It's, it's not a great measurement, but can we come up with a structural proxy for local yield stress directly? And Andrea, can I ask a question? Rearrangements. So I... what we did was we tried to train on the local yield stress, okay? It turns out that we couldn't do it. We got terrible results, very, very poor prediction accuracy. We could do it though with, by feeding the system images, okay, of a particle surrounded by its local environment. Okay, if we feed it that image, it turns out ResNet works much better. Your Andrea, ResNet can I ask work. a question? Yeah. So you said that softness is not a good, a good predictor for um, in brittle systems. Is it because softness is able to predict local rearrangements and in the brittle system it's it's very long range? I mean there is this this big uh, big crash is is there some relationship between I don't think that's what it is because once we um, are able to train on local yield stress instead it's the coupling of the local yield stresses that gives you a shear band it's a coupling of local things that in the end gives you a shear band. So even though it's very extended, it is still formed of localized things. And in fact, if you look at the if you look at what's happening during the stress drop, you follow the stress drop from top to bottom. If you did a movie, it looks exactly like the movie I showed you earlier, localized rearrangements triggering each other. It's just that they keep triggering each other in this region. All the all the rearrangements are localized in this region, but they're but they're but each individual one is tiny. Okay. Okay. So um, so the cool thing is that if we use if we use ResNet to look at the local yield stress, we actually do better at predicting rearrangements than we did with the support vector machine, which trains on rearrangements directly. Okay. So in other words, uh, the range of softnesses that comes in, or not softnesses, but uh, a yieldness, I, I hate to use that word, but you know, a structural proxy for yield um, is, is actually much, works much better um, than to predict rearrangements, it's steeper. The probability of rearranging is steeper as a function of that quantity than for uh, than if you train on rearrangements directly. Okay, so now what we would like to do, we're going to look at this system, okay, um, from, in, prepared by Monte Carlo Swap, and let's compare the results um, of our model to the simulation. Um, so. In the case where it's poorly annealed, okay, um, here are the step model, here's the simulation. You see that, you know, strain is not localized in either case and rearrangements are not localized. Um, but in the, in the case of the very well annealed case, in our model, we get strong strain localization and localization of rearrangements and, um, and, and same in the, in the, model in the real in the simulation um, we do that for polymer pillars these are at some temperature so we're putting the pillars at some temperature uh, uh, under tension they're pulling them but they are at a temperature it's below the glass transition temperature okay this one is this one is just below the glass transition this one is quite a bit below the glass transition okay and uh, again we find qualitatively quite good agreement in terms of how the degree of strain localization. And in the granular systems, uh, we do that as well. So here are the, the experiments, granular experiments. Okay. So I should say that for the granular experiments and for the um, polymer nanopillars, we just train softness on rearrangements. And it's only for this one system, um, uh, 
the system that showed extremely brittle behavior that we used to, instead of softness, we used a structural proxy for local yield stress. For the others, it's just the ordinary softness. Because, you know, like in the experiments, we don't know what the, what the interaction potential is. Okay. Um, and quantitatively, we get quite good agreement too. So the darker curves are for the simulation or experiment, and the lighter curves are our model. Okay, in each case, and and they're quite good agreement. And this is just, again, going through the steps I showed you before of understanding the interplay of rearrangements, of elasticity, and plasticity for each each case, same model, and just getting different parameter values when we when we work that out, and um, then sticking it into the lattice model. Okay, great agreement, right? But as I say here, so what? Did we learn something? And so here's how we learned something. What we did was we started always with the least ductile case as the baseline, that's the black, okay, in the step model. And then we vary the step model parameters, like what's the range of the short range facilitation? What's the magnitude short range facilitation? All these things, we vary those parameters one at a time and until they reach the value that they have in the most ductile case. And we say, which ones made a difference? And you see that for the soft disks, there's only one that really made a ductile, that changed it. And what was that? That was the distribution, initial distribution of Y, the structural proxy for the yield stress. And that's exactly what it should be, right? Because what was different was the preparation history that changed the initial distribution of local yield stresses and that's all you needed to change the model and that gave you ductile behavior. Otherwise, everything was the same, okay? So there we know what we changed and what came out was exactly what we expected. So we know that the model is telling us something. So now let's go to the Granoa system where we don't really know. We're, we're changing the size of the particle relative to the range of, re of the interaction but we don't know how does that play out in terms of the facilitation, the short range and the long range facilitation, what is it? And we found out that there were two things that made it ductile. First of all, it was the dependence of the yield strain on softness and it was the near field softness, okay? Um, and uh, so that's what we were changing. That's how we were changing. What, that's changing the range of interactions is changing how, if I have a rearrangement here, how does that affect the softness nearby? Okay. That's hi, actually- Hi, Andrea. Uh, that, that's, that, that's this. It also depends, it also changes how the yield strain depends on softness. Hey, Andrea. So now we, that tells us the intuition for how interaction range controls this. Yeah, question. Yeah, yes, um, have you looked into work hardening? using these models? We haven't looked at work hardening yet, but we would like to see that. Okay. Yes. But this is for disordered systems. I mean, we can do this. We can do this potentially for crystals, but then we have to have the microstructure right. Again, it's this initial softness distribution that you have to get right. So, I think it would be very interesting to apply this to crystals and, and work it all out there as well. Um, and, and that could be, you know, a better route towards understanding crystal plasticity because we know that softness works for crystals. Um, okay, and then in the last case, the polymer nanopillars, it turns out that the important thing to change was the size of rearrangements that you, as you lower the temperature, Okay, this is in the thermal system. The rearrangements actually get bigger. And that was the controlling thing um, there. So, um, so, so it's interesting. That's where the, the physical intuition comes from because by varying the step model, you can say, aha, what was important and what was responsible for changing the ductility in this case. Okay, so... Um, so that's the story and really where are we heading? Ultimately, what we would like is a, a field theory, a field description, right? We've got softness as a field, we've got elasticity as a field, we've got a, 
a plasticity field. They are coupled together in this way. And we should be able to write down, instead of putting it on a lattice, we should be able to construct just a series of partial differential equations for how they couple themselves together that you can then solve. Um, so that's that's sort of where we're heading with this. Um, okay, so, um, so I hope I've convinced you that yes, machine learning is useful for dimensional reduction and we can harness them to really construct theories um, and that the glass problem in this glass problem, we were actually able to do it, first of all, to look at dynamics of supercooled liquids and then also to look at plasticity. Um, and uh, these are the people who did the work. So given the time, I think I'm just going to skip the lecture that I was going to give. It's, it's rather, it's not, it's shorter, but it's not that short. Um, to talk about persistent homology, how we use persistent homology to understand the microscopic origins of function um, in, uh, in networks. Um, that's another data science thing, uh, using another data science again to extract um, physical understanding. But I'm gonna, I'm just gonna skip that, I think, and, and just answer questions. What, what do you think? Andrea, it seems okay if you, if you, uh, I mean, uh, you know better than us, I guess, that uh, what is the best uh, to organize. It seems nice for us, right? I mean, uh, I don't know, maybe we could see, I could, I could maybe tell a short version. Do, would people rather hear a short version of something totally different or would they, or, or is this enough? Maybe a show of hands. <laughs> Could you could we'd you like give to a, see a short version? Yes, could you give us a flavor like, in, a, in the in the rest of the talk? Would be able just to... yeah, for the last twenty minutes. I could talk about something totally different, change gears, talk about the persistent homology, or we could just talk more about this. I mean, I could just answer questions about this. Let me see how people. Are the... Yes. Who, was, who wants questions? Okay. So we have uh, only one person who wants questions, uh, uh, Andrea. So I think uh, you can okay, go on. Okay, that's, that's clear then. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, let me pull up this talk and get it going. Okay. All right. So, um, all right. So. So to do this, I need to tell you about first this function, okay? So um, this is a function called allosteri that a lot of proteins have. And the idea is that there's some molecule here that wants to bind to this protein and then get chemically modified by it, okay? But right now it can't bind, okay? It cannot bind until this other molecule, this regulatory molecule here, different kind of molecule binds over here. And once that does, it, it binds, it changes the conformation of the protein so that this thing can bind here, okay? And so this is an example of turning the enzyme on. And we can think about it mechanically as we're applying a strain here and we're getting a desired strain there, okay? And I'm gonna tell you, and okay, flow networks. This is a brain vasculature. It does the same thing. It actually does this. It's doing it now in all of us. So. Um, what's happening is that there's blood coming in through the arteries into the brain vasculature. Okay, it's a network of vessels. Okay, and depending on what you're doing, you'll need more blood flow here or there to support the brain in that function. So I'm talking, so my speech cortex needs more oxygen and therefore there's more blood flow to my speech cortex. And how's the brain doing that? It's contracting some vessels and dilating others. So it's changing the conductivity of individual edges of this network in order to, in response to a source pressure drop at the arteries, deliver a target pressure drop to my, a desired target pressure drop to my speech cortex, okay? Um, mechanical and flow networks are very similar. I'm gonna talk about this a lot more tomorrow. Um, and now the question is how does so I'm going to call that flow allosteric, okay? Getting a desired target 
pressure drop over here in response to a source pressure drop elsewhere. Okay, you see the analogy to protein allosteric. But you get a strain, desired strain over here at the target in response to a strain applied at the source. Okay, so that's my general allosteric function. Um, and if you think about it, this is again hard for statistical physics to handle. Why? Because, you know, we can handle either identical particles or a few different classes of particles or totally random assortments of particles, right? But here we have 21 amino acids in the case of the protein, 20, sorry, <laughs> 20 amino acids. Uh, and, um, and the amino acid sequence is not random at all, right? It's, it's designed by evolution in order for the protein to have this allosteric function. And in the case of the brain vasculature, the conductances of the edges of this network are not random, they're tuned specifically to deliver a target pressure drop to be given place. So if we want to use a statistical physics approach and use data science to do this, first of all, we know from data science, we need lots of data. And we know from statistical mechanics, we need lots of data, we need ensembles. And here we need ensembles that are designed to do the right thing, not just any random ensemble of conductances on networks. They have to be networks that perform the same function. Okay, and so that's what we figured out how to do. And I'm going to tell you about that tomorrow. So just take it, or Friday. So just take it on, take it from me. We can do this. Okay, so we can, we have designed ensembles that give us, uh, I should maybe go back, give us a desired pressure drop here at the target in response to pressure drop at the source, or a desired strain at the target in response to the strain applied at the source. Okay, and this is just the tuning process that eventually we're going to get to a strain at this is the strain at the target. The strain at the source is one. We're eventually going to get to a strain at the target, which is also one. Okay, so we can do it. I'll tell you how on Friday. Okay, or here we have a pressure drop at, at the source. That's the artery that I call that one. And I want, I'm going to tune the conductances until the pressure drop at the target is 0.2. Okay, and, and, and we can do that. Okay, so those are ensembles, right? We have designed ensembles, ensembles of networks, different networks that do exactly the same thing, okay? So, so what we wanna understand is how does tuning these edges, the conductances, you know, at the microscopic scale lead to this emergent function of allosteric? So what are we doing? Um, and for that, we look at an extreme case, okay? So this is the flow networks. I have a pressure drop of one at the source, and I want the, the highest the pressure drop at the target can possibly be at the target is the same, is one. And if you look at how the network does that, it does that by dividing the network into two pieces, okay? So these blue dash ones are edges where the conductance has essentially been sent to infinity, okay? So there's no, there's no, these, these two sectors are nearly disconnected from, from each other. And everything in this sector has a pressure of minus a half, and everything here has a pressure of plus a half, okay? And here's another example. It's the same. This is with periodic boundary conditions. So again, it's divided the system into two sectors. Okay, so that says in this extreme limit, the difference is topological. And, I, and by the way, Felipe Rodriguez Martins, who, who's there with you guys, is, is working on this. He, he's, he's, uh, he, he's using persistent homology, um, uh, applying it to our learning networks. Okay, so, so you can ask him for details about this. Um, so, um, so that's what's happening. It's a topological difference, right? It doesn't depend on which boundary I put in here. I could put the boundary over here. It could look like this. It doesn't matter what the boundary looks like as long as I divide it into two sectors. So that's a topological, not a geometrical thing. And so that's what led us to use persistent homology to identify features 
uh, to, to, to figure out what if we tune to a much less extreme case? You never have all the blood coming into the arteries going to the speech cortex. That's a small fraction of the blood that comes into the arteries that goes to the speech cortex, right? So you're never in this extreme case. If you're not in that extreme case, can you still find sectors? Can you still find um, something, you know, understand the physics? Um, so I, let me, okay, I will just explain because there's no point in doing this if I don't explain. So let me explain how persistent homology works, okay? So here's our network. Here's an example network. And I have now the pressure drops across each edge and they're numbered according to their magnitude. So the lowest pressure drop is zero, okay? The next lowest is one and the highest pressure drop is 22, okay? So there, and now I imagine adding the edges in the order of their magnitude. So the lowest pressure drop is zero. I put that in first. Then I add one. It, one is connected to zero and two is connected to one. So these all form one connected component, okay? But now I add edge three and it's not connected to the first three. So it now forms a new connected component. Okay, so this, so so there's a connected component here that's born at the pressure drop corresponding to edge three. Okay, now if I keep going, if I add four, aha, that's not connected to either of the two. So there's a there's another connected component that's born at, when I add four. But when I add six, what you see is the connected component of four is joined up with the one at three. They are all joined up into one connected thing. And so the thing that was born at four dies at the pressure drop corresponding to six. So that's a, what's called a birth-death pair. There's a connected component that was born at delta P4 and died at delta P6, okay? You can keep going, okay? And then you see that the one that was born at delta P3 died at when the 15th edge was added, et cetera, okay? So when you, you could, then what you do is you draw a birth-death diagram. So this is, I'm just explaining how persistent homology works. Okay, so, um, so here's the pressure drop at which a feature was born. There's one born here, there's one born here. Okay, um, and where they died. Okay, so that's two points. I could do the same process in reverse. I can stop with, start with the highest pressure drop at 22 Okay, first add 22 and then add 21, that's connected. And then I add 20, aha, uh -huh, something was born at 20. Okay, that one died when I got to 15, et cetera. Another one's born at 19, died at 17. So I can do the same thing going down. That's called the descending filtration. This is the ascending filtration, okay? Now let's look at, we have our ensembles. So let's look at an ensemble of networks. And what I'm gonna plot is a heat map of their, the birth and death of connected components in our networks, okay? And here's the untuned case, and here's the case where they've been tuned to have a pressure drop, target pressure drop of 0.8, okay? That's not the extreme. The extreme value is one. This is 0.8, it's below. And you see something. You see something born on the descending filtration at 0.8, and you see that on the ascending filtration, there's a feature that dies anywhere between zero and 0.8, okay? Um, and this is not an accident, okay? So, um, so that tells us that persistent homology can tell us something, okay? Um, all right, it turns out though that when we're going up the sending filtration, that tells us the basins, okay? That persist all the way up. But when we come down, it gives us the cracks and that's basically the same sort of information. So we don't get new information going up and down. Um, um, so that's what these things correspond to. And just to show you that, you know, it really, these features really do correspond to the tuning function. Here it is for varying the tuning threshold. Okay, so here we're varying the tuning threshold and for each tuning threshold, we get a feature. Okay, we, we see it appearing and we see it here as well, okay? So I said, okay, we've got something. But the problem is that if you look at the connected components that you get from this, 
just looked at the ones, um, for example, in these lines, yeah, what you see is a mess, okay? So what you need to do, it turns out, you need to do some coarse graining, and that's basically where the physics comes in. Up to now, it was just standard thing that mathematicians do, okay, for persistent homology, that's, that's what they do, but now the physics comes in, and what we do is we take these different connected components, they're basins of, of sort of nearly uniform pressure drop, right? Each, each connected component has a very similar pressure drop. And, um, and what we do is we coarse grain, um, and that's a physics thing. So you can coarse grain. So if you take a cut across, what you have, you look at the pressure landscape as you take a cut across, and it's rugged like this. And what you do is you just take it and you coarse grain um, until the two target nodes are just about to join the second same basin. Okay, I'm not, I, I don't have to, I'm not going to go into it, but just take my word. There's a coarse graining step. Once you do that coarse graining step, you get sectors. And these sectors tell you what is the tune function. So this is a case where I have one target, okay, and six different sources, sorry, one source and six different targets, and it ranges itself into several sectors of nearly uniform node pressure. And the distribution node pressures in each sector is given by this distribution, these different colors of distributions. And from the mean of the distribution of node pressures in the red, compared to the purple, I can pull out the means of these two distributions, that, that difference is essentially the same as the target pressure drop that was actually tuned in. So here's the pressure drop that was tuned in. Here's the sector pressure, the mean sector pressure difference. So if I, if I target that spans these two sectors, I take the mean of the node pressures in this sector, the mean of the node pressure in that sector, look at the difference, okay? I plot it as a function of the pressure difference that was actually tuned into that target and the dashed line is saying they're equal. They're very, very close to equal. Okay, so it really works. Whether you know, and this is the purple here is I have 120 different targets in a in a in a network with 512 nodes. So I'm tuning in a huge number of targets, and it still works. This this this. So there are many many sectors, but um, the sectors differences still tell us the the two pressure drop. So, um, so, so it works, okay? Persist homology actually tells us quantitatively the function that was tuned in, okay? And we can understand it. What we're saying is, okay, I have more here on mechanical networks. I'm gonna skip that. We can do the same kind of analysis for mechanical networks. It's more complicated because strain is over regions. So if I'm in three dimensions, I have a Delaunay tetrahedron um, and I need to calculate strain over that. So things are more complicated. We can do it for, these are our, our physicist model proteins of spherical networks, okay, that we tune to have different allosteric functions. But once we have that analysis, we can apply it to real proteins. We apply it to 20 real proteins and what we see looks very much like our design spherical proteins. Um, and uh, again, quantitatively, we can say something about what's happening, um, but I'm just going to skip, I'm gonna skip that. I'm sorry, because I don't, I, there's no point doing it if I don't have enough time. But just to say that um, we're hoping that this sort of persistent homology analysis is useful not only for these systems, but a whole lot of other networks that are tuned to have functions, biochemical signaling networks, maybe ecological networks, neural networks, yeah, artificial neural networks as well, well as real neural networks. And you know, a big question if you have a neural network, as I said, was interpretability, understanding what came out of it. But if we can have this sort of a sector picture of what the system learned, you know, maybe we can get in some insight into, into how it learned it and what, what it learned. Um, so, um, 
But what did we learn, right? What we learned was that the tuning of these edges, what it did was it affected the topological structure of the response, giving you sectors, okay, for the flow networks, it gives you sectors. And that sector picture gives you a powerful way of thinking about how the system learns something. Um, so, um, yeah, in the case of the mechanical networks, it turns out that we can do, so in, in the flow networks, the dimensional reduction is just down to one thing, which is that the, the difference of the pressures, average pressures within each sector, that's what matters, okay? So it's a huge dimensional reduction just down to the average of the node pressure within a sector. Okay, and again, it's a microscopic variable, a relevant microscopic variable, uh, which is the pressure within of a node, okay, um, reduced down to averages, it's the average or, or distributions, right, it's the average within each sector. Um, so it's, it's, again, that dimensional reduction piece that we need to do in statistical physics coming about this time through the persistent homology. Um, and uh, turns out the mechanical case, you need two variables. Um, I'm, I didn't go into it, but you, you again get dimensional reduction, not quite as much as in the flow networks, to two variables instead of one. Um, um, yeah, and so, and I just want to say, the person who did all of this was Jason Rocks, an amazing graduate student, and my group who is now a postdoc um, at BU at Pankaj Mehta and um, also in collaboration with my terrific colleague, Eleni Katapuri. Okay. Thanks, Andrea. Let me see, is there any question? If you want to, yeah, just. Um, Professor Andrea, uh, I'm referring to the beginning of your talking, when you wrote a uh, Gaussian statistic for the subtenance variable, random variables. Have you think about another kind of statistic like a Gaussian with a table with a power-like behavior, something like that? I know th there was a there was a long time ago a statistic called Tessales statistics. These things could be useful, don't you think about that? Why, 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 what is the specific reason to use the Gaussian statistic for the, for your hundred variables? Yeah, so the really, I, we think of this as sort of a feature of softness that the distribution of it is really very close to Gaussian. I mean, you know, we sort of take that as an encouraging sign that, you know, um, that we're doing the right thing. <laughs> that we got a hold of, a, a, you know, um, you sort of hope in statistical physics that when you get a hold of a variable that we think it's important, that it's, that its distribution is Gaussian, right? And that you can get away with just characterizing it in terms of its mean and variance. And, and, and here it is. It's not, it turns out it's a little bit skewed to the high scout side but it's really quite close to Gaussian. Um, so that's something that emerges from once we define softness, um, but then we take advantage of the fact that it's near Gaussian and in our theories, we assume that it's perfectly Gaussian. Did I answer your question? Your, your voice was cutting in and out, so I, I'm not quite sure I did. Yes. <laughs> Professor André, I have another question that's related to, to your remark about the ultimate goal of your theory. I know that the people, a long time ago, uh, have started melting processes using disordered field theories. You told that you expected to use partial differential equations. Why not expect statistical disordered field theories for your phenomena? Do you have any... I'd like to know your comments about the future, future like that. Well, I'm really having trouble understanding. What kind of partial differential equations do you expect to describe your phenomena? 
Can, can, can you can you try holding the, maybe the microphone a little further away? Maybe that'll work better. It's just cutting in and out a lot. I'm, I'm having trouble parsing the question. Hello? Just, uh, just a, a minute, because he's explaining the question for the Nilo in Portuguese. Just a... Uh, uh, I'm not sure about, about the question or what. Uh, what I, I think he, he I is wondering whether you can address these questions with, with the statistical field theory of, of disordered systems in general because you, you said something about using partial differential equations. And he was wondering whether there is a disordered field theory that you could use to, to address this kind of question, or, or what's the motivation for using the partial differential equations? So we don't think that there's an existing theory out there that has the ingredients that we have. But what we're hoping is that once we have it, we'll see connections to other theories that we can compare to and say, aha, this is this ingredient that was included in this model, left out of that model, that, that sort of thing. Um, because you see these ingredients of, so as we are doing with the elastoplastic models, now we have these structural elastoplastic models we can compare and say, okay, this is what this model includes, that's what that model includes. You know, we can compare our model, for example, to kinetically constrained models, which are rather similar in that the structure nearby determines the kinetic constraints, the, the rules. And we can say, okay, how similar is it to this model or that model? So, so this is sort of where we're heading. We, we would like, now that we have the models, we'd like to be able to compare them to other people's models and theories and say, you know, what ingredients do we have that they don't have? How similar is it? Okay. So, um, Andrea, thanks a lot. Uh, we see you on Friday, right? Then yes. For, for your last lecture. Thank you. Thanks, Andrea, again. If you like, if people have questions, somehow it's easier when they're 